Welcome to the reading of the book, What Happened from the Cross to the Throne, by E.W. Kenyon. First words. This book will blaze a new path in constructive interpretation of the Pauline Revelation. It uncovers many new veins of primary truths long covered by sense-knowledge interpretation of the Word. The first ten or twelve chapters deal with the legal side of the plan of redemption. It shows what God did in Christ from the Incarnation until He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. It gives a brief summary of what the Incarnation had within it. The earthwalk of the man reveals the fact that Israel had Jehovah on their hands. The author of the covenant, the law, the sacrifices, the one who had appointed the priesthood and the great day of atonement was in their midst, and they did not recognize him. The tragedy of the garden scene where angels strengthened and comforted the rejected Jehovah, the incarnate Son of God, the trial with its bitter jealousy, its deception and dishonesty, where the God of the old covenant was spit upon, reviled and cast out by the very people he had brought into being, the cross with its agonies, where the hero God-man became sin. Perhaps the strangest feature of it all was that not one person knew that he was dying for their sins, that he was bearing the penalty of their transgressions. Three days of gloom and darkness settled over the hearts of the disciples. The kingdom dreams were ended. They did not understand where the Master had gone or what he was suffering. They were staggered by his resurrection. They were mystified by the forty days before his ascension. They did not know he had carried his blood into the heavenly holy of holies. Neither was it known that he had delivered the Old Testament saints from paradise when he ascended from Mount Olivet. They little appreciated the fact that the cloud that received him out of their sight was the Old Testament saints being taken to the Father's house. They did not know he was to sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The legal part of the work of redemption had been completed, and now the vital could begin in the upper room. Much of this will be new to you, but I want you to read it with an open mind. It has transforming power enwrapped within it. Many believe that this message is a forerunner of a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit with a revival such as the nation has never known. It would be beautiful if it were the ushering in of the last days. If you have not read any of my other books, and your heart is hungering for a clearer knowledge of your rights and privileges in Christ, we urge you to feast upon them. This book contains many repetitions. However, it is unavoidable as the subjects would be incomplete without them. Chapter 1. Struggle for Faith the faith problem is becoming very acute. Waves of unbelief are sweeping over the church. Many of our leaders have been swept into the whirlpool of modernism. Earnest thinkers are seeking for a solution. The greater percentage of the devotional writings of the past century are from the pens of the mystics. Today, there is a demand for a definite, well-defined path that the bewildered minds of this troubled age may find their way into the realm of faith. A new investigation of the Pauline Revelation is demanded. The question is being asked by many, have we had the whole truth? Did the pioneers like Luther, Calvin, Arminius, and the Wesleys have the whole truth? We reverence these men for what they have given us. There has been far too little growth in the knowledge of the Pauline Revelation since their day. Here is a new approach to the heart of redemption. It is an answer to the question, what happened from the cross to the seating of the Master on the right hand of the Majesty on high? We believe that the age of sense-knowledge doctrines is past. Christianity is not in its dotage. It is more virile than any of the thinkers have recognized. It has within it the solution for the human problem. Christianity has the vitality and ability of God. The Pauline Revelation has the solution for the faith problem. When I discovered the apostles who were in close companionship with the Master knew nothing of the real mission of the man, I was staggered. They did not know what happened at the Incarnation. The fact is, they did not know that it was an Incarnation. If Mary did tell them what had taken place, they received it as an idle tale of a fond mother. When they stood about the cross and watched the death throes of the man who was hanging there, they did not know that he was Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel was crucifying the blood covenant partner of Abraham, and they were ignorant of it. When Jesus commanded them to tarry until the Spirit came, they did not understand what was going to happen. They had followed the wonder man, yet who he was, why he came, what he was to suffer, and what they were to gain by his suffering was all unknown to them. They did not know what happened on the cross, or during the three days and nights before his resurrection. But we must know of these three days, for this is the thing that will build faith in us. The mystery is hidden in these three days. I wonder if we dare face the facts as they actually are. If you could eliminate all you know about Jesus from the Pauline epistles and go back with me now and stand before the cross with John, Peter, Mary, and the others, if we could be as ignorant of who he was and the reason for his death on the cross as they were, I think we might appreciate the unveiling that the Father gave to Paul. The disciples did not know the man as a substitute. They could not comprehend what was going to take place in the upper room. Chapter 2 
established in righteousness. Righteousness is the key word in Paul's epistles. It means the ability to stand in the Father's presence without the sense of fear, condemnation, or inferiority. Here is a promise of it. Isaiah 54, 13 and 14, And all thy children shall be taught of Jehovah, and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shall they be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. The greatest blessing of the new creation is to be established in righteousness, to acquire a righteousness consciousness. We have a sin consciousness. We have had a weakness consciousness that has kept us slaves of fear. As a nation, we have tax consciousness and will have it for generations to come. But what a sense of victory, of freedom would be ours if we knew that we were the righteousness of God and were established in that fact. Sin consciousness has made slaves of the human race. It has destroyed the initiative in multitudes. It has been the oldest and most persistent enemy of faith. You cannot have faith in the word when you are under condemnation. You see, righteousness means the ability to stand in the presence of God. What would sonship be worth if we did not have righteousness? The father would have no pleasure in his children because they would be shrinking, cowardly, fearful beings. The children would never enjoy the father's presence. No redemption would be worth the name that did not include righteousness. No new creation in sonship would be worth the title if righteousness did not become a part of it. So the object of the redemption that God wrought in his son was to make man righteous. That was the ultimate objective of the father. He dared to make his son a substitute for the human race. We were bankrupt, sold out to the adversary, hopeless. Ephesians 2.12 describes it, that ye were at that time separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Hopeless, godless, but here. God now lays upon his precious son the iniquities of us all. He not only pays the penalty of our transgression, but he conquers our enemy and master, Satan, and strips him of his authority and makes recreation a possibility on legal grounds. Now God can give to man eternal life, his own nature. He drives out of man the old nature, the old self, and he gives him a new self, a new nature. Man becomes a new species, as one translates 2 Corinthians 5.17. The old man that is recreated is the human spirit. Then God renews his mind, bringing it into subjection to this recreated spirit. The new man gains the ascendancy over the senses or the physical body and becomes a master of himself in Christ. This new man now has become the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Him who knew no sin, he made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, we become righteous by receiving a new nature. Israel had righteousness reckoned to them, set to their account, but the new creation has God himself as their righteousness. Romans 3.26, that he himself might be righteous and the righteousness of him who has faith in Jesus. Marginal. Not only does the Father himself become our sponsor and our righteousness, but in 1 Corinthians 1.30 we read, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is made unto us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now we are sure he is our righteousness, because God made him to be. If language means anything, we have a legal right now to stand in the Father's presence just as though sin had never been. 2 Corinthians 9.10 is now clear. And he that supplieth seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Jesus said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. The vine is righteous and the branch is the righteousness of the vine. So the fruits of the vine would naturally bear through the branches will be called the fruits of righteousness. Those fruits will be the same type of fruit that Jesus bore in his earth walk. We have the joy of bearing a type of fruit that Jesus could not bear in his earth walk. He could heal the sick, feed the hungry, and raise the dead. We bear another kind of fruit. We lead men to Christ, which gives them eternal life. We can lead men into the depths of the knowledge of God's righteousness that he wrought in Christ for them. We can do things for men's spirits that Christ could not do. You see, he had not yet died and paid the penalty for our sins, making the new creation possible. We can have this spiritual fruitage in Christ. This being established in righteousness gives us a foundation on which to stand and a reliance in our outlook on life. You see, man has always been a servant of the devil, a cringing slave. This new creation with this righteousness makes him a master. He is no longer a subject of the adversary. He is now a master. He does not talk of his weakness and failures, but rejoices in his newfound ability to make the heart of the Father glad. Now he is to act as though he knew he was righteous. He is to take advantage of the fact that he is the righteousness of God. He has a standing invitation to come into the throne room and visit with the Father at any time. Hebrews 4.16 Come boldly unto the throne of grace. 
He knows he is the righteousness of God, just as clearly as that young woman knows she is married to her husband after the ceremony is performed. She holds the place of wife in their home. The two have become one. This new creation knows that he is the righteousness of God and that he has the legal right to the use of the name of Jesus. He knows the name has all authority in three worlds. By his union with Christ, he has become not only an heir to the authority in that name, but he has become a present holder of that authority. He may use it now. When Jesus said, All authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth, that authority was for the new creation, not for himself. This righteousness makes a man actually one with Christ. It has given to man a creative ability, a dominating spirit. He is an overcomer. He is a master. The new love life of the master has taken possession of him. He has become an actual Jesus man. He takes Jesus' place on earth. He is not like the men under the old covenant. They had limited righteousness. He possesses unlimited righteousness. They had righteousness reckoned to them. This righteousness is imparted to him. It is the very nature of the Father. Israel became righteous by edict. We have become righteous by the new creation. This new wonderful righteousness makes us fit companions of Jesus and will fit us for our eternal fellowship with the Father through the ages. This is really the genius of redemption, the miracle of the new creation. Now dare to think of yourself as being exactly what the Father says you are. Dare to go into the Father's presence with fearless joy, making your request known to Him. You see, He is your Father. You are His child. In the name of the Redeemer, you have access to the Father's presence at any time. Whatsoever ye ask in my name, I shall give it you. We are not honoring our place as sons or our standing in righteousness unless we take our place. Let us make the Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Holy Spirit proud of us. A Heart Message When Jesus approached the tomb of Lazarus and said, Roll away the stone, Martha must have clutched his arm and whispered, It's too late, Master, his body decayeth. Jesus turned and looked into her face, saying, Martha, said I not unto thee, if thou believed, thou should see the glory of God? The stone had been rolled away. He stepped to the mouth of the tomb with divine assurance. He had no sense of faith or lack of it. He illustrated unconscious righteousness. He revealed what righteousness really is. I have gone back in my dream life and stood by the side of the master when he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. My heart trembled and I whispered, Master, why did you speak so loudly? You see, I feared that Lazarus would not come forth. I feared for the reputation of the master. What would the people think if he did not come forth? These fearful thoughts, born of sense knowledge, were disrupted, for righteousness had spoken, and Lazarus came forth. Chapter 3 The Incarnation The Incarnation was the union of deity and humanity in the babe of Bethlehem. It was love's intrusion into the realm of selfishness. The long-anticipated had at last arrived. God was united with humanity. The intrusion was not with an army. It was in the form of a dainty babe. It was like love, a helpless thing. They called his name Jesus. That name has filled the ages with songs and melodies. It has brought courage to the defeated, liberty to the slave, strength to the weak, healing to the sick, and eternal life to the world. That babe who gave Mary her first great joy in that little town of Bethlehem restored to woman the crown that she lost in the Garden of Eden. She was man's helpmeet. She became his slave after the fall. Jesus gave her hope equality, and made her the queen of the heart of the new creation. The supernatural birth of the child Jesus was part of the covenant promise that God was keeping with Abraham. How could a child be born and not have the Adamic curse upon it? How could a child be born without sin so that he could stand in the presence of God without guilt or inferiority? That is the miracle of the Incarnation. Physiologists have proven beyond a question that the mother does not impart her blood to the babe that is formed. Let me quote from The Chemistry of the Blood by M. R. Dahan, M.D., pages 31 and 32. It is now definitely known that the blood which flows in an unborn babe's arteries and veins is not derived from the mother, but is produced within the body of the fetus itself only after the introduction of the male sperm. An unfertilized ovum can never develop blood since the female egg does not by itself contain the elements essential for the production of the blood. It is only after the male element has entered the ovum that blood can develop. The male element has added life to the egg. Since there is no life in the egg until the male sperm unites with it and the life is in the blood, it follows that the male sperm is the source of the blood. If a fertile hen's egg is put in an incubator for several days, tiny veins of blood will form inside. That is not true of an egg that is not fertile. This proves that the blood comes from the sperm of the male. We know that if Jesus had been born of natural generation, fathered by Joseph, he would have had the blood of fallen man. But he was conceived of the Holy Spirit. The life that was imparted to him was from God. The blood, which was the life of his body, came from the Most High, who overshadowed Mary. The blood of that babe was not the blood of a common man. 
It did not have the taint of sin. We have come to know that sin is in the blood, and the human blood and the human spirit are in some way united. Jesus had in him the blood of God, his father, just as every child has the blood of his or her father. Life is in the blood. Leviticus 17.11 For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. American Revised Notice in the margin, For the soul of the flesh is in the blood. Again, by reason of the life in the blood, or by reason of the soul in the blood. This is a very remarkable statement. The life of the flesh is in the blood. When the blood is drawn out of the body, death follows. The life of God was imparted in the blood of Jesus. Thus, Jesus was born without the Adamic nature or the sin that came through Adam's blood in his conception. Jesus was sinless. You see, it is very evident that the life that is imparted to a man in the new birth enters his bloodstream. A scientist has just discovered that he can tell if a man has eternal life by his blood. When we become partakers of the divine nature, our spirits are recreated. There is a union in some way of spirit and blood. How? We do not know. Thus, our bloodstream is cleansed of the sin that has come down through the blood of the human race. Jesus was conceived without sin. His body was not mortal. His body did not become mortal until the Father laid our sin nature upon him. When he hung on the cross, the moment that he became sin, his body became mortal. Only then could he die. When this happened, spiritual death, the nature of Satan, took possession of his spirit. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Him who knew no sin... He made to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. This phase of the Incarnation is of vital importance to us. We can understand now why Jesus had dominion over the laws of nature, over the fish of the sea, over life and death. He healed the sick, raised the dead. He dominated the forces of darkness. You see, Jesus was the covenant God manifested in the flesh. So it was necessary that He be circumcised into that covenant. He had once given that covenant law and everything pertaining to it to Moses through an angel. Now he had come to fulfill this covenant with Abraham. The high priesthood and the senate had Jehovah on their hands, but they knew it not. I have always wondered why they hated him so. I understand their bitterness now. They had Satan's nature in them. Satan hated Jesus because he was God. Consequently, he tried to destroy him from the time of his birth. If we knew the history of the life of Jesus, it is likely that we would find that Satan made many attempts on his life. Now you can understand the natural hatred that the Jews have for him today. He was their blood covenant God. In their wild frenzy, born of satanic power over them, they engineered his death. There was bred into them a hatred that has come down through the ages. They despised the very name of Jesus. They cannot help themselves. Jesus was their blood covenant God, manifested in the flesh. The legal side. A legal substitution would be impossible without an incarnation. Deity must assume the liability of the fall of humanity. God must have known that man would fall when he created him. Man was created in the face of that fact. Universal humanity has demanded that deity assume the liability for that fall. A substitute must be provided, actually taking man's place, suffering what humanity should suffer, meeting every claim of justice in behalf of fallen man. Only then could God be vindicated. An angel could not fulfill these demands. No man could be the substitute. Only God himself could fulfill these requirements. An incarnation of deity and humanity was demanded. The account of the incarnation is found in the Gospel of Luke. It tells of the Most High overshadowing the Virgin Mary, and she conceived in her womb that holy thing. You see, Jesus did not partake of the mother's nature. She simply clothed him with sinless flesh. Had he been conceived of the seed of Joseph, his body would have been mortal. Because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, he possessed a body such as Adam had in the garden before the fall. The incarnation proves the pre-existence of the man Jesus. Philippians 2.6 who existing in the form of God counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. There could not have been an incarnation had not Jesus had a pre-existence as deity. In the English, it is word. In the Greek, it is logos. In the beginning was the logos, and the logos was with God, and the logos was God. There could be no incarnation unless there was a perfect unity of deity and humanity. This occurred in the man Jesus. In the eyes of sense knowledge, men, it is a miracle. In the eyes of God's knowledge, it is normal. God's knowledge is spiritual. Man's knowledge is of the senses.
1 Corinthians 2.14, For the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot know them, for they are spiritually revealed. I told you the incarnation was the desire of natural man. All primitive people have believed in an incarnation. To me, the incarnation was God breaking into the sense realm, manifesting himself in the flesh. He made a covenant with Abraham. Now he is keeping that covenant. God actually thrust himself upon the Jewish nation, and especially upon the high priesthood. They did not realize that the God to whom they had been offering sacrifices was at last among them. He had come into their midst incognito. He only revealed himself to them through the miracles and intense love for humanity. They could not recognize him. Satan had blinded the eyes of Israel. Their Jehovah was among them, yet they did not know him. Read the father and his family for a more complete discussion of this subject. Chapter 4. What Happened During His Earth Walk Only a visitor from heaven could tell you what the earth walk of the man of Galilee meant to men. Jehovah of the old covenant made with Abraham had suddenly appeared in the form of a man. Everybody thought they knew him as the son of Joseph and Mary. He was the unknown. He came unto those who were his own, and they failed to penetrate through love's disguise. He went about doing love deeds in love's way. He had a herald, John the Baptist, who pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. No one knew that John was heralding the King of the Jews, their Jehovah, who had come to his own people Israel. As one reads the four Gospels, he is convinced of a restraint upon each writer. All of them knew who this Jesus was. Luke had found Christ through Paul's ministry. He knew the Pauline revelation. But there is not one sentence in the writings of Luke that intimates this fact. Mark had been Paul's companion, and the same thing is true in his writings. They only wrote what the Spirit gave them. In John's Gospel, there are but two suggestions of the Pauline revelation, and yet John must have known that revelation. It thrills one when you think of the divine restraint that was put upon every one of these men who were to tell the story of the man. The visitation of Jehovah to his covenant people cannot be compared to any previous happenings in Israel's history as a nation, for it was unlike anything they had ever known. He was their covenant God. He had cut that solemn covenant with Abraham. There is no doubt in my mind but what the Master was ever conscious of this covenant. Jehovah had taken human form. Not once did he reveal that he was the one who delivered their fathers out of Egypt. They honored Moses more than they did Jehovah. They worshipped the law more than they did Jehovah. John 8, 58 and 59, when Jesus said, Before Abraham was born, I am, they took up stones to cast at him. He startled them. He had come very near to declaring who he really was, but sense knowledge men could not grasp it. Matthew twenty two thirty one and 32. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. This is the limit to which the Master could reveal himself. We as believers can look back upon that scene and recognize him as the God of the Old Covenant, but we have revelation knowledge given to us through the Pauline revelation. Philippians 2, 5-9 gives you a graphic picture of Jesus in his earth walk. Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God, counted not the being on an equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. That is the earth walk of Jehovah. 1 Timothy 3.16, He who was manifested in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 shows the condition of Israel, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of the unbelieving, that the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should not dawn upon them. They were in spiritual darkness, which means satanic bondage of the mind and spirit. Galatians 4.4 4 will add to the picture. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. I have often wondered what would have happened if Israel's eyes had suddenly been opened. Rejected. Isaiah 53, 3, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Jehovah had come to his own, but they despised him. He came to a place of suffering and rejection. Luke 18, 31 and 34, And he took unto him the twelve, and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all the things that are written through the prophets shall be accomplished. Unto the Son of Man, for he shall be delivered up unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon, and they shall scourge and kill him, and the third day he shall rise again. 
The earth walk of Jehovah was the saddest walk ever taken. We can remember in Matthew 27, 22 through 26, where the priests were forcing Pilate to crucify Jesus, and Pilate refused to be responsible for the blood of Jesus and washed his hands of the whole thing. The mob cried, Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Away with him, away with him, was their crazed demand. They were crying for the blood of the God of Abraham and did not know it. It is the eternal God of the three tenses on trial by his own blood covenant people. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. 1 Corinthians 2, 8 brings tears to the eyes, which none of the rulers of this world hath known. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They crucified the Lord of glory and had no consciousness of the enormity of what they had done. Paul was the first to receive a revelation of it. He recognized Jesus as the Messiah, the God of the Old Covenant. The God of the Old Covenant was this God of love. When he was manifested in the flesh as Jesus, it was really love in human form. Jesus had love's ability to bless and help men. He knew who he was, why he came, and what it would cost him. He was love incarnate. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He was the Son whom God gave, because He so loved these sin-cursed, deluded men. In Luke 20, 9-19, Jesus tells the story of the man who planted a vineyard and led it out to a husbandman, and went into another country for a long time. Then He sent a servant to visit the vineyard and receive fruit from it, but He was beaten and sent away empty-handed. This occurred three times, and then the man decided to send his own son in the hope that they would reverence him. But the wicked husbandman schemed to kill him, that the inheritance might be theirs. God sent His Son to the vineyard, and He was mistreated and crucified. How little He was appreciated by His own. God so loved. It was love that drove Jesus to become incarnate. Love drove Him during His three and a half years of public ministry. It was not the cruel spikes driven through His hands and feet by the Roman soldiers that held Him to the accursed cross. It was love. John 6, 37 and 38 might help us to grasp this more clearly. All that which the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh unto me I shall in no wise cast out. For I am come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. John 10, 10. I came that they may have life, and may have it abundantly. Love sent him. Love sustained him. Love was his ability. He came with a single purpose, to redeem man from the realm of selfishness, where Satan ruled as king. Jesus lived in this realm for thirty-three and one-half years. He walked in the realm of selfishness and sin, and yet he walked in love. Sin did not taint him. He was a stranger among his own people. He was not understood by his mother, half-brothers, or friends. Love had come into Satan's realm. He was love. He revealed love. He acted love. He is the wonderful Jesus lover. He was Satan's first master. How it thrills us that love should master Satan. It makes us realize that love can master selfishness. Jesus was the world's first free man. No man had ever been free before him. What a thrilling statement. If the Son shall make you free... You shall be free in reality, John 8, 36. Only a free man can set others free. Only a lover can inspire others to love. He was the first man free from selfishness that the world had ever known. No wonder they wanted to rid themselves of him. He did not seek his own. He claimed nothing. He gave everything. He revealed a new kind of love. He was love's first experience in human form. He was God's word made flesh. Now you can understand, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. He was the true knowledge of the living Word. Reason cannot understand this, but our spirit feeds upon it with joy. The Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I wonder if you have ever noticed Moffat's translation of Hebrews 4.12. The Logos of God is a living thing, active and more cutting than any sword with double edge, penetrating to the very division of soul, spirit, joint, and marrow scrutinizing the very thoughts and concepts of the heart. And no created thing is hidden from him. All things lie open and exposed before the eyes of him with whom we have to reckon. He is referring to the Bible as we call it. It is the living logos of God with whom we have to reckon. The word takes on personality. The word scrutinizes my thoughts. The word knows the innermost thoughts and conceptions of my heart. This word becomes a living thing on the lips of faith and in the heart of love. His actions were motivated by love. He did not try to prove his deity by performing miracles. It was love that drove him. He wanted to alleviate suffering, agony, pain, and grief. Matthew 23:37 is one of the most vivid love pictures in the life of the Master. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, that killeth the prophets, and stoneth them that are sent unto her, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hand gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. There was a sob in that, tears mingled with agony. 
One can hardly read the next verse. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Now you can understand those tragic words on the cross. It is finished. And then the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. The temple and the Holy of Holies were left desolate. God had deserted it. The blood covenant people had rejected their Jehovah, and he was weeping over it. He turned his steps toward the cross, the climax of his earthwalk. Jehovah, the man of Galilee, was born in a manger and reared among the poor and the underprivileged. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It is hard to conceive the loneliness experienced by the Creator. Homes are closed against him. Rather than endure persecution and ridicule from the religious leaders of the day, they excluded their Jehovah from their circles. He was an outcast. I was as a child cast upon thee from my mother's womb. Satan sought his life from his birth. Perhaps, if we knew more about the earthwalk of the Master, we would see a life filled with loneliness and heartaches. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He is the despised and the rejected one. And yet, he is love. Chapter 5 What Happened in the Garden Here is a picture of the God-man, the one who had been driven by love to face the sacrifice of himself. Here is a demonstration of supreme love. God so loved that he gave. The Son so loved that he suffered. I believe he suffered more in the garden than he did on the cross, for he was facing Hades. On the cross he felt the agony of Hades. In the garden he knew he must be made sin, and his whole being shrank from it. But his love drove him on. If you had followed him into the garden and heard him pray, you would have been gripped by a strange new force. It was deity in agony. He was revealing love's power, something that the world had never before experienced. Love's ability to suffer, love's ability to sacrifice, love's ability to endure. It was love's consent to be made sin, go to Hades, to suffer the torments of the damned for unworthy man, when he cried, Not my will, but thine be done, or not my will, but thine be carried through to completion. Deity was facing substitution in the garden. The crisis had come. Jesus and three of his disciples had gone down to the place where he oft resorted for prayer, under those old gnarled olive trees. They had seen him in prayer many times, but this was different. Telling them to wait and watch, he went alone a few steps and fell upon his face. They heard his voice, but could not distinguish his words. He was facing the fact of being made sin. His disciples did not know this. It was not a theological or metaphysical substitution, but he was to actually become a substitute for fallen man. He was to become a partaker of man's physical body. He had not yet partaken of his sin or mortality. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin, but not by natural generation. His body was like Adam's body in the garden before he sinned. It was neither mortal or immortal. It was a perfect human body. Adam's body became mortal the moment that he sinned in the garden. As mortal, his body became subject to disease and death. The body Jesus possessed was a perfect human body. You remember in John 10, 17 and 18, Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one taketh it away from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it again. This authority receive I of my Father. You can see by this that no one could kill Jesus. His body was not mortal. It did not become mortal until he hung on the cross. Him who knew no sin, God made to become sin. Jesus became sin. His spirit received that terrible thing that came to Adam in the garden, separating man from God. It does not seem possible that Jesus could become sin. He was as holy as God is holy. Sin had never touched him. True, for many years he had lived in the midst of sin, tempted in all points like as we are. But sin had never become a part of him. Now he must become sin and be separated from his father. As man's sin substitute, he must go to the place where the man who rejects him must go. He must suffer there until the entire debt that humanity owed justice had been met. Jesus knew why he came out from the Father. He knew why he came into the world. He knew before he came what he would have to face. He knew what he must suffer. Now you can understand that cry of agony, Matthew 26, 36 through 46. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go yonder and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and sore troubled. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Abide ye here, and watch with me. And he went forward a little, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples, and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if this cannot pass away, except I drink it, thy will be done. 
And he came again and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying again the same words. Then cometh he to the disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that betrayeth me. Let us notice carefully. He said to the disciples, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Abide ye here and watch with me. And then falling on his face, he cried, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. It is difficult for us to comprehend what this meant to the master. It was more than a separation from his father for three days and three nights. He was to partake of spiritual death, the nature of the adversary. It has been said that God could not do a thing like that. That is sense knowledge reasoning. It is hard to understand how he could become sin, but I know he did. Sense knowledge is limited. It cannot understand the spiritual things of God. In 1 Corinthians 2.14 it says, Now the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. When one says to me, You know, I cannot accept that. I cannot believe that. I understand why. You live in the sense realm, just where Peter, James, and John lived when they walked with the Master. Their minds were darkened as far as spiritual things were concerned. They could not understand. We have received the nature and the life of God. We have the same Holy Spirit in us who dwelt in Jesus and raised Him from the dead. That is the reason we understand the things of the Spirit. Jesus knew that the moment had come, and He was to be made sin. He must partake of that dread nature of the adversary. His body would become mortal. Satan would become his master. This was the tragedy of the garden. Jesus was to suffer the agonies of the lost. He was to be reckoned among the transgressors. He was to bear the diseases and sins of the human race. He was to be forsaken by his Father. It is no wonder that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. It is no wonder that he cried, Father, if there's any other way. But there was no other way. He and he alone must pay the penalty, or humanity would be eternally lost, and God through eternity would be childless. Angels came and ministered to him. They did not minister to him on the cross. One of our literal translations reads, If it be possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, but thine be carried through to completion. It was not a weak submission to the inevitable. It was the heroic Son of God facing humanity's great need and crying to the Father, Carry this thing through to completion and save the human race. That is why Paul cried, He loved me and gave himself up for me. I have come to believe that there was deeper spiritual agony in the garden than on the cross. Anticipation of union with spiritual death was so hideous, so utterly unthinkable, that if angels had not ministered, we do not know what would have happened. However, when Jesus came from the garden and faced the sleeping disciples, he came as a master. He had won the fight. He came not weeping or bemoaning. He came as the conqueror. There are two places in Christ's career that challenge the heart. The first is when he met Judas and the soldiers in the garden. Here he stands as the perfect hero, the matchless conqueror. He had won the first battle. Now he is ready for the trial, ready for the scourge, ready for the cross. The second picture that thrills my heart is when he left the tomb and met the disciples and cried, All hail! He had conquered. He had put sin away. He stands as the Lord of Lords now. The shame and the agony of hell are over. He is the hero God, my Lord, my Master, the conqueror. The battle in the garden was spiritual. Sense knowledge cannot grasp it. He had broken into the sense knowledge realm. He had purposed to redeem man out of the hand of the enemy. To do it, he must surrender himself to that enemy. There are two great forces here, one seen, the other unseen. They are both dominated by Satan. Satan ruled the Sanhedrin, the Senate, and the Roman governor. He was seeking to dominate the spirit of the Son of God and bring him into subjection to himself. Jesus knew the hour was coming when Satan would have him under his control. But now, facing the soldiers and the trial of the Sanhedrin and the judgment hall of Pilate, he walked as a king. Chapter 6. What Happened at the Trial This is the tragedy of the ages. The one who had cut the covenant with Abraham, cared for the children of Israel like a nursing mother cares for her child, was on trial before the very high priesthood that he had established. He was not only Mary's son, but God, Jehovah himself. How vividly this scripture stands out. He came unto his own, and they that were his own received him not. They received him to nail him to the cross. In that trial he stood before Pilate, the Senate, and the high priesthood with the dignity of God. Not once did he call their attention to who he was. He did not argue with them. He did not plead with them for mercy. He had been delivered up by the determinate counsel and the foreknowledge of God. The high priesthood were the ones who were to carry out that determinate will of God. The Godhead was never shown so clearly as at the trial. He was every inch of him God. He was not resigned. He was not submissive. He was not a martyr. He was love. You remember how one glance from his eye broke Peter's heart. 
No wonder Pontius Pilate sought to save him from the cross. Love was on trial, yes, but he was an absolute master. He was God manifested in the flesh. The arrest and trial of Jesus is one of the tragedies of the human race, and especially of God's chosen people. These covenant people were familiar with the Abrahamic covenant that had brought them into being as a nation. They knew the significance of the blood covenant. The tragedy is that Jehovah, the blood covenant friend of Abraham, came to earth, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, born in a manger, welcomed by an angelic choir, grew up among his own people, yet remained a stranger to them. They did not know him. They witnessed his miracles. His compassion and love for them was recognized by all. He turned water into wine, caused a tree to die by a single sentence, dominated the laws of nature, healed the sick and raised the dead with words. His people witnessed all this. He walked the waves and calmed the storm. Surely they must have known that he was the Son of God. Jealousy had such a dominance over the hearts of the leaders that they sought to put him to death. He and his people could not live together. You and I can see that he is Jehovah. As a nation, they have Jehovah upon their hands. What are they going to do with him? He had been circumcised into the covenant. He was part of that blood covenant. He had come to his own, yet they that were his own would have nothing to do with him. He came to redeem them, and they cast him out. He was the Jehovah of the Red Sea and of Jericho. He had caused the sun and moon to stand still in the days of Joshua. He had blessed and protected them until they repudiated him and were carried into captivity. He was Jehovah made manifest to the senses as Jesus. He tread the saw that he had given to Abraham for his covenant people's home. He was their Jehovah. They were his blood covenant people. He loved them. They despised him and demanded his arrest. They had their Jehovah on trial. You who understand the significance of the blood covenant shudder at the thought of what they actually did. The person they had on trial had cut the covenant with Abraham. Every one of the men who shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Let his blood be upon us and upon our children had the mark of circumcision upon their flesh. They were crying, Crucify Abraham's blood covenant God! I wonder if you have ever realized the tragedy of what they did. What grief they brought upon themselves. Let his blood be upon us, their blood covenant Jehovah. They denied their blood covenant God. They turned him over to a heathen governor to be scourged and crowned with thorns and crucified. His covenant men followed him up Calvary's hill as he carried his cross, hurling words of derision and hatred at him. Paul said blindness had fallen upon them. Their covenant God was in their midst, and not a person recognized him. He was neither loved nor worshipped by his people. Zechariah 13.6 describes it vividly, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Marginal lovers. He called them his blood covenant lovers. These same men insisted that their Jehovah be nailed to the cross. This was the tragedy of the ages. I have often wondered why the Jewish people have suffered so intensely. There seems to be born in them a bitter hatred toward the man they had crucified. Man always hates the one he has betrayed. They possess the same attitude today at the mention of his name. He was their blood covenant friend and Lord. He was betrayed in the house of Israel, his blood covenant friends. His people treated him as an enemy. They crucified him and shouted, let his blood be upon us. It was judgment blood. It should have been the blood that would eternally bind them to their covenant God in the new covenant. They made it a blood of judgment, separating them from their Savior and the Father God. He came to make good the promises of the covenant. He came to make them sons and daughters. He came to establish a new covenant with his own blood. They crucified him. Chapter 7 What Happened on the Cross? The cross was the climax of love and manifestation. There is no love without action. It is not love until it acts. Love was unveiled on the cross. That God-man who hung there had come of his own volition. He was not a martyr. He was a supreme lover. God so loved that God was Christ. All of the attributes of God were made manifest on the cross. There was a holy dignity, a strange serenity, a marvelous sense of sureness in the entire scene. Jesus was just as confident a master on the cross as he was when he said, Roll away the stone. Pilate and the priesthood and the senate did not sentence Jesus to death, nor did the Roman soldiers nail him to the tree. It was the unseen forces of Satan that guided them. They were merely instruments. That potentate believed that he had gained the ascendancy and that he was the master. He did not know that he was destroying himself by attempting to destroy the man. That Jewish hierarchy did not know that in the mind of justice they were crucifying the Jewish nation, and that the high priesthood would die with Christ on the cross. They did not know that the sacrifice of bulls and goats was ended when Jesus said, It is finished. Their priesthood was finished. 
Sense knowledge stands mute in the presence of the tragedy of the eternities. Deity is to suffer for humanity. Justice had demanded, and he becomes answerable. Justice was decreed that man must pay the penalty of his transgression. Man is in bankruptcy. Man is impotent, helpless. Man is a slave. He cannot approach God. He cannot meet the demands of justice. And so, out of the heart of God comes the solution of the human problem. His son says, Here am I, send me. And on towards the cross he goes. One of the most difficult features of this study is the disciples' ignorance of what is taking place. They did not know Jesus in his earth walk. They were but sense-knowledge men. By that I mean all the knowledge they had had come to them through what they could see, what they could hear, what they could feel, what they could taste, or what they could smell. These five senses were their only teachers. 1 John 1, 1 through 3, That which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we beheld and our hands handled, concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare unto you the life, the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you also, that ye also may have fellowship with us. Yea, and our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Understand that our scholastic world has no other knowledge than that which has come through these five senses. There is another kind of knowledge that the world folk repudiate. It is the revelation knowledge, God's knowledge. The disciples did not know that Jesus was going to be made sin on the cross. They did not know that he was going to die spiritually. They did not know that he was their substitute and that he was going to put sin away and make it possible for them legally to receive eternal life, the very nature of God. They did not know that the man of the cross was going to rise again from the dead and was going to be the head of a new creation, a new type of man. No one had ever told them about receiving eternal life. No one had ever received eternal life before. It was a new experience, a revolutionary one. They had listened to Jesus and heard him say, I am come that ye may have life and have it abundantly. They had heard him say, He that believeth on me shall pass out of death into life. They knew he used a strange word, zoe. They did not know there were two kinds of life, zoe and suki. Nor did they know there are two kinds of death, physical death and spiritual death. No one had ever told them that there was a new kind of life coming to the world, and every one who became a partaker of this life would become a new creation. They did not know where Jesus had gone when his body was pronounced dead on the cross. They did not see the awful tragedy that was taking place when he hung there. They witnessed the strange phenomena mentioned in Luke 23:44. It was now about the sixth hour, and a darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Creation went into mourning when the Creator became man's substitute. Matthew 27:51 through 54 says that an earthquake took place. Creation was shaken to the very center by the tragedy of deity becoming humanity's substitute. Matthew 27:51 tells us, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. No one knew what this meant. The Holy of Holies was no longer the home of Jehovah. He had moved out of the temple. Jesus had fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant and the law of the covenant. There was no need of a priesthood any longer. The high priest finished his ministry when he made the great sacrifice of the Lamb of God, who was to take away the sin of the world. There will no longer be a holy of holies, a place for the atonement blood to be sprinkled. When Jesus said, I will destroy the temple and restore it in three days, how little they understood him. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. The new creation is God's temple today. His death and substitution will make the former temple unnecessary. He is going to become the new high priest. He had made one sacrifice for sins forever, and he is to sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The priests did not know that their priestly duties had ended. The Jews that stood about the cross did not know what God was going to give to Paul 20 years later. Read the first eight chapters of Hebrews. Galatians 2.20 in the revised version reads, I have been crucified with Christ. The whole Jewish nation had been crucified with him. The entire human race had been crucified with him. They did not know it. History tells us that 50 years after the crucifixion of Jesus, there was not one member of the high priestly family living. Neither could they find a member of the Davidic family. The priesthood was to last until Shiloh came. Shiloh had come, and they did not know him. Genesis 49.10, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. And unto him shall the obedience of the peoples be. They did not know that the man hanging on the cross was their Shiloh. They did not know that the priesthood would stop functioning before God when they slew him. They did not know that the Mosaic law which they worshipped but did not keep would stop functioning when they nailed him to the cross. Here are some facts for our hearts to assimilate. 
Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, Surely he hath borne our sicknesses, and carried our pains, and we have come to esteem him as the one who is stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, who is wounded for our transgressions, who is bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and Jehovah hath made to strike upon him the iniquity of us all. Literal. Here is a picture of the substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. In the ninth verse, Isaiah says, He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. The word death is plural in the Hebrew, indicating that Jesus died twice on the cross. He died spiritually the moment that God laid our sin upon him. The moment that him who knew no sin became sin, that precious body became mortal and he could die physically. If you will notice, the moment he became sin, darkness came down over Golgotha. And he cried the bitter cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the darkest hour of eternity in heaven. How the angels must have covered their faces. The universe went into mourning when God made Jesus sin. Now we can understand Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Yet it pleased Jehovah to bruise him. He hath made him sick. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Jehovah shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. It was demanded, and he became answerable on the ground of his sacrifice. God will be able to justify many because he bore their iniquities, because he poured out his soul unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and now is able to make intercession for them. That is almost a literal translation. The 22nd Psalm gives a graphic picture of the crucifixion of Jesus. It is more vivid than that of John, Matthew, or Mark who witnessed it. The crucifixion scene was written a thousand years before the lone Galilean hung there on the cross. It opens with his cry on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou answerest not. And in the night season I am not silent, but thou art holy. O oh, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel, our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted, and thou dost deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. This is a monologue. You can see him hanging there on the cross. He is paying no attention to the mob about him, the deep physical agony, the awful shame of hanging naked in the presence of his enemies, the knowledge that his father had forsaken him is breaking his heart. He remembers Israel's history. Jehovah had heard their cry and delivered them. But he says the strangest words, But thou art holy. What does that mean? He is becoming sin. Can you hear those parched lips cry? I am a worm and no man. He is spiritually dead, the worm. He has become what John's Gospel 3.14 said, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. He had been lifted up as a serpent. Serpent is Satan. Jesus knew he was going to be lifted up, united with the adversary, that holy man of God. And the psalmist sees him as the worm, the reproach of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted on Jehovah that he would deliver him. Let us see him deliver him. Marginal. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe on him. Now the monologue continues. He is hanging there, surrounded by the multitude, led on by the high priest. He cries, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me trust when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God, since my mother bore me. You remember, as soon as he was born, an angel told Joseph to take him to Egypt. He was the God-cared-for baby of Bethlehem. But now he is the God-forsaken Son of God, hanging upon the cross. As the forsaken man of Galilee, there he cries, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. The disciples are powerless. His own people, headed by the high priest, have seen that he was nailed to the cross. There is none to help. And now he says the strangest words, Many bulls have compassed me, strong bulls of Bashan have beset me, round about. They gape upon me with their mouth as a ravening and roaring lion. What does he mean by the bulls of Bashan? It is the Sanhedrin and the Senate. They are the leaders of the herd. They gape upon him, and they crucify him. Then comes the strange sentence, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint, my heart melteth within me. What does it mean? John 19.31-35 tells us what happened. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross upon the Sabbath, for the day of that Sabbath was a high day, asked of Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. The soldiers therefore came and break the legs of the first and of the other that was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, and saw he was dead already, they break not his legs. Howbeit one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, 
and straightway there came out blood and water. Jesus had died of a ruptured heart. When that happened, his blood from all parts of the body poured in through that rent into the sack that holds the heart. Then as the body cooled, the red corpuscles coagulated and rose to the top. The white serum settled to the bottom. When the Roman soldier's spear pierced the sack that held the blood, water poured out first. Then the coagulated blood oozed out, rolled down his side onto the ground, and John bore witness of it. The psalmist a thousand years before that dread scene on Golgotha described it more accurately than any of the eyewitnesses. Hear the next sentences. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. That is the reason they always gave the crucified one a drink of vinegar. Then comes the next awful sentence. For dogs have compassed me, a company of evil doers have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and my feet. Who were these dogs? The Roman soldiers, they had nailed him to the cross, and you notice he called them dogs. Jews always called people outside of the covenant dogs, a no people. I may count all my bones. Every bone in his body was crying out against this inhumane, devilish agony. But to me, one of the saddest sentences that dropped from those parched lips was, They look, they stare upon me. That holy man hangs naked before his enemies. They look, they stare upon me, they part my garments among them, and upon my vesture do they cast lots. Under the shadow of the cross, seated upon the ground, gambling for his undervest, the soldiers pressed around. They heeded not his agony, the death sweat or the pain. They were like our modern folk. Their hearts were set on gain. You have seen a picture written 250 years before crucifixion was practiced, a thousand years before the tragedy of Golgotha was enacted. But do not let the physical sufferings or the graphic scene of Golgotha rob you of the reality of the Son of God being made sin for us. We have seen that Jesus' death on the cross was more than a physical death. He was there by divine choice and plan. He actually was made sin with our sin. He was God's substitute for the human race. When he was made sin, he was turned over by God to the adversary. When that heart-breaking sentence fell from his lips, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Satan became his master. You remember that he uttered the sentence, It is finished. You can now understand that he did not mean that he had finished his substitutionary work, but that he had finished the work the father gave him to do first. As a son, he had done his father's will, spoken his father's word, and done his father's works. Second, he had finished his work as the son of Abraham. He had fulfilled the Abrahamic covenant. He had kept the Mosaic law. Now, he is to become a substitute and deal with the sin problem. He is to put sin away. He is to satisfy the claims of justice against the human race. He could not do that in his physical life. Sin basically is a spiritual thing, so it must be dealt with in the spiritual realm. If Jesus paid the penalty of sin on the cross, then sin is but a physical act. If his death paid it, then every man could die for himself. Sin is in the spirit realm. His physical death was but a means to an end. Paul says in Hebrews 10:12, But he, when he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. When Jesus died, his spirit was taken by the adversary and carried to the place where the sinner's spirit goes when he dies.